I am thrilled to be here. And when Lisa uh, reached out to me and asked me if I would talk, I just, I just had a happy moment in my heart because even though I'm not yet a Texas master naturalist or Texas master gardener, those are next on my list. And so I'm thrilled to be speaking to the master naturalist Gal Galveston Bay area chapter and the master gardeners Galveston County chapter. So thanks for being here and sharing this hour with me. I wanna in particular thank Lisa Belcher and Chuck Snyder and Jean, is it Fissler for helping me with all things technical and preparatory for this talk. So I'm gonna share my screen and what I'm gonna talk about today is the why and how, um, why and how to garden for wildlife in your own backyard. And I think another way of saying this would be the what, why and how of gardening for wildlife at home. And I say that because my talk, uh, if you think about it, breaks down into three natural parts. The first is, what do I mean when I use the word wildscape? And what is that? And then also, what kind of critters pollinate in those gardens? Although wildlife gardens um, support more critters than just pollinators, pollinators are super cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. The why is, why do we need or should we change our gardening habits in order to make our gardens a wildlife habitat? And I think that's a valid question, y'all. You know, I always have, I have understood, you know, my students like it a lot better. When I uh, ask them to do something, if I tell them why they should do it. And so I think that's a legitimate point to spend some time on. So we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of eco services those insects and other critters bring us and why it's imperative that we do this kind of gardening, at least to some extent, at our own homes. And then finally, the how of gardening for wildlife. I've broken down into five easy peasy practical tips for doing this at home and listen carefully, not just in a way that supports wildlife, but that will please your neighbors because it looks like a garden and so it will get social acceptance, which is just as important. So let's begin the begin, as they say, and talk about the what, why, and how of gardening for wildlife. So first, what is a wildscape? So some people call it a wildscape, others people call it a wildlife habitat garden or a habitat garden, doesn't matter what name you use. It's simply a garden, the primary purpose of which is to support wildlife. Sort of unsurprising when the word wild appears in the name wildscape. But what does that really mean? And so I like to say that wildscaping um, focuses on three areas in our gardening. First, plant choice. Second, garden design. And third, maintenance practices. So every choice that I make in my own gardens at home here in Houston, in, smack dab in the city, right? Um, every choice I make for what plant to include, how I design my garden, and then afterwards, once they're installed, how I maintain it has this purpose in mind that you see on the screen. And the rejoice and be glad moment, y'all, is that it can be 100% supportive of wildlife and also be 100% accepted by the community. And we'll talk about some specifics in a minute. So in an urban or a suburban area, like in Clear Lake, Houston, Galveston, and other cities, where we live with other people, right? We need to craft our wildscapes in a way so that they are, in the words of Rainier and West, and I'll show you a screenshot of their book later, they become a designed plant community. And truly, I think they're spot on when they say it's a hybrid of horticulture and ecology. Why? Because a designed plant community is one that translates wild plant communities that we see in the coastal prairie, which is what our region was before humans inhabited it. So it translates those, those um, plants and, and communities and structures from the coastal prairie into something that can be read as a garden. In other words, it is not ecological restoration. I love that we have places like the Katy Prairie Conservancy which is really getting us back to ground zero, how it was before humans came in and maintaining the prairie that way. We need that. 
But we live in cities and they're not gonna go back to prairie. They're gonna stay with humans in them. And so what we need to do is to find a workaround to work in the kinds of plants, communities and gardens that our neighbors will accept, but that also will support wildlife so that wildlife can thrive in our cities, just like people. So I always like to say to folks that it's really about the two C's. Wildscaping is equally about critters as it is about community. So we'll talk about how to do those two things with our wildscapes. You know, and a picture is worth a thousand words. So I think the biggest thing to take away from this talk today is that it's not either wildscape or totally traditional, right? It is not a binary thing, all or nothing, either supporting wildlife or not supporting it. To the contrary, another rejoice and be glad moment is that it's a sliding scale. On the one hand, you can have gardens that are completely supportive of wildlife that are looking very traditional, all the way on the other hand to having gardens that support wildlife that look very wild and mimic what's out in our coastal prairie, for example. So I'm gonna so, show you examples along that spectrum with the permission of these awesome friends of mine who let me share these photos. So this is on the traditional end of the scale. This is from Russ Kane, who's a, a Native Plant Society of Texas or NEPSOP member with me here in Houston and has his hands in a hundred different volunteer things. He's awesome and I aspire to be him one day when I grow up. Um, so this is from his home in Houston, his family's home. You can see that it's not 100% native plants, but it is heavily favoring na native plants, very much in large part plants that are native to our eco region here on the coast of Texas. That said, there are some traditional roses in here. None of those traditional plants is going to be invasive. And look what he does. Now on the bottom right, this is an overhead view from the second floor. So you see pathways, you see distinct garden beds, borders, borders within borders, um, sort of traditional looking native plant choices for shrubs, for example, and trees and garden art. It reads as a traditional garden, doesn't it? With pebbles and mulch and so forth and things more spread out. But this is 100% wildlife supportive. Moving along the middle, this is from Jaime Gonzalez, again, who I aspire to be when I grow up. Um, he works with the uh, Nature Conservancy here in Houston, and this is his family's home gardens. So on the left-hand side, what you see is their backyard. And he uses a technique, although he has borders, he uses a technique that's called green bordering. Um, and you see this at some of the, um, the prairie scapes that we have in Houston. So there's not really a formal border of stone or wood here but simply a sharp delineation between the plants in the bed, see how tall they are, and the lawn in between. And this is a great choice for um, folks who wanna have an area in their lawn front or back where they can actually hold family gatherings and the kids can play and the dogs and cats can play. Um, so this again is sort of middle of the scale. And what you see on the right-hand side is what he calls it his family home prairie. Um, every spring, he takes mounds of soil along his lawn, puts them in an interesting design, and embeds them with native uh, wildflower seeds. And they bloom all spring and much of the summer. And the neighbors know about it, and they come and celebrate it. It's a cool community. This is in your area in Clear Lake, Jerry and Susan Hamby's home. You can see here we're getting a little more wild looking in the contents of the bed. But notice the trick that they use, very clever to make it look intended and not untended. The, the more like the wild prairie our beds are inside of the bed, the more the eye needs a chunky border of wood or stone to make that garden bed look intentional, to make it read garden in the parlance of Rainier and West, right? So these are, I think these are all native plants to our eco region, but the borders are chunky and so it reads as garden. This is the wildest example. Now this is a friend's former house. It was in the heart of Houston where there are no deed restrictions or HOA rules. I adore this cottage garden. You can actually see that there's a trellis and there are pathways, you just can't see them from the curb. So again, it's really a choice of your aesthetics. All of these gardens, 
support wildlife in ways we'll talk about later, but they are on a sliding scale from more traditional to more wild. And now I'm gonna show you my own home gardens in the Northwest part of Houston. Our house is under 1600 square feet inside and the front and backyards are comparable. They're not huge. This is my front yard. And I would say about 60% of my front gardens are um, turned into garden beds. At this point, we're about 90% of the species in our garden are native to this eco region of Texas. And uh, that fact, along with changed practices, has resulted in an explosion of biodiversity in my little garden. So we just counted our 51st species of butterfly last year in my little home gardens in the northwest part of town. You can see how my aesthetic is more like a cottage garden and how I plant very close together. But look at this chunky border, including this path, which is made from reclaimed concrete and pavers and is actually a swale to absorb water. Again, it depends on whatever your aesthetic is. And here are some more images of it. Again, I have some you know, little structural things here. I've got some uh, uh, old uh, insulators that I use as art. So this is just where my garden is. And I'd say this is probably in the middle of that slide. Okay, so now that we've talked about what a wildscape is and we've seen examples along that sliding scale, I thought it would be a good idea to talk about what pollen needs in a wildscape. So uh, unsurprisingly, a pollinator is simply any animal that takes the pollen from the male component of the flower and while feeding on nectar or pollen itself, deposits that, uh, that pollen into the female component of the flower. And there are some plants that don't need animals to pollinate them, but the majority do, and we'll see about that in a minute. So that's all that a pollinator is. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk primarily about insects here, but insects are not the unique pollinators. So of course, bees are hugely beneficial pollinators. So they have actually a couple of fun facts about them. And by the way, there's a method to my madness, y'all. When I describe their mouth parts and how they eat, file that away because we're going to talk about that later in our choices for plants and designs. You with me? So bees are really cool. They actually descended taxonomically from wasps. So as Dr. Jaw at UT likes to say, she calls them vegetarian wasps because the babies of bees, their larvae feed on pollen, almost primarily feed on pollen whereas the larvae of wasps primarily feed on other insects. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they have therefore evolved with the females having what we call scopa or um, very specialized hair that, that works like sort of like a, a dusting mop, right? That um, pollen clings to, and they use that to carry it back to their nest to make little uh, cakes out of, the, out of the pollen. So this is a participatory class. And in the words of Tom Lehrer from years ago, those who don't participate have to stay afterwards to clean the erasers. You get that reference, welcome to my world. Okay, I want you to hold up your pinky finger and I want you to look at the flesh colored part of your pinky finger. Okay, that is the size of this entire flower head in the middle. This is Texas frog fruit. Some people call it, I think, turkey tangle frog fruit or phyla flora. It is my all time favorite native ground cover for reasons that I can answer during Q&A if you want. This bee is smaller than that flower head. And this bee is not the smallest bee in North America. That is the fairy bee. Certain of those species are only a couple of millimeters big. So keep in mind that they can range from something that tiny to, hold up your thumb, Look at the distance, the length of your thumb from the last knuckle to the tip of it. That is approximately the size of some of our larger carpenter bees, like this eastern carpenter bee here on the left. Um, this one's a bit smaller. And our bumblebees, which tend to be on the larger size. So they vary a lot in size. And look at the different colors. Like, who knew that they're green and blue, right? They have red, green, blue brown, orange, white, black, yellow, all different colors, not just yellow and black. Bees feed with a tongue, which can be longer or shorter. Um, and primarily the adults will feed on nectar where their larvae feed on pollen. And by the way, there are around 4,000 species of bees, um, native bees to North America, and the honeybee is not one of them. It's European originally, and it was brought in as a domesticated insect to produce honey. 
than butterflies. So butterflies are really, so they're gorgeous. <laughs> um, these are some of the examples. And by the way, um, as Doris was mentioning before, I should have mentioned the pictures of insects and plants here um, come from my wildlife habitat gardens. I take these photos with my cell phone. Let me say that again, I take them with my cell phone. Did I mention I take them with my cell phone? Um, so it's a, like I said, it's a lot of crawling around on the ground and pursuing these guys and a lot of patience. But so these are actually from my gardens. And so they can vary in size from a wingspan of like the giant swallowtail that's about the size of a, an adult hand, about the length of it from finger to wrist, all the way down to just tiny little butterflies like some of the blues. I think this is a rear Kurtz blue, which are the size of a fingernail. Um, and they feed very differently from bees. They have um, an appendage called a proboscis. And the proboscis, it does have a tube in the middle, but it actually works more through capillary action like a sponge than it does through um, sort of a sucking type of action. Um, butterflies are not as good pollinators as bees, at least the larger ones, because their legs tend to be long. And so the primary parts of their body that touch the flower and transfer pollen are the proboscis and the feet. Moths. So moths are in the same order as butterfly, which is the order Lepidoptera, which means, <coughs> excuse me, scale wing. That's what Lepidoptera means. And um, anything that looks like fur on a butterfly or moth is actually a specialized scale. So that's kind of a cool fact. Moths, a lot of them feed at night, so they're nocturnal, but there are, there are plenty that feed during the day. You see some examples here. I literally have no idea how many moths we have at my home garden, St. Julian's Crossing. I just haven't recorded them, but uh, I've documented the different species and some can be stunningly beautiful. So again, these feed with a proboscis like butterflies, but because many tend to be smaller and closer to the ground, maybe, maybe they transfer pollen a little more effectively. I don't know. And then flies. So this blew my mind when I first started studying about pollinators. I had no idea that flies could be pollinators. But remember our definition of a pollinator. Any animal that while feeding on the flower transfers the pollen from the male to the female component of that flower or another flower. Okay, so flies fit that category. In fact, the majority of adults, not all true because some are predatory, but the majority of adults uh, or parasites, but the majority of adults will feed on nectar and some will feed on pollen. Their mouth parts differ very much from those of the insects we've talked about before. They come out on a little stalk and they're like a short sponge, so they don't extend very far. And although most flies tend not to be very fuzzy, which means that pollen doesn't stick as well to them as it does to bees, because they're kind of low to the ground, they do rub up against that flower and so they're actually not bad pollinators. The cool thing about some flies, like for example this fly on the bottom left, this one on the middle right, and this one on the top right. These are examples of a family of fly called hoverflies or surfid flies or flower flies. Not all, but some of the species of hoverfly have larvae, so their babies are predaceous. Not all, but some. And so the single larva of, uh, depending on the species of a hoverfly can consume anywhere between two and 400 aphids, depending on the species before it pupates. So I want that in my garden. These are a big part, these kinds of hoverflies with predaceous larvae. They're a big reason that we haven't used pesticides in at least six years in my gardens. I don't need to because these take care of it for me. And bonus, the adults are pollinators. Wasps. So I am one with wasps, y'all. Wasps actually pollinate. And the reason for this is that the vast majority of adult wasps feed on nectar or pollen. The cool thing about wasps, y'all, is that the females of almost all species will use their stinger to paralyze things like white flies, aphids, mealybugs, scale, and yes, our butterfly and moth caterpillars, and yes, other insects, sometimes even spiders, um, other arthropods. And then they put them in their nest for their babies to paralyze, but alive for their babies to consume when they hatch. So wasps are particularly good at keeping our gardens healthy and balanced. And other wasps are what we call parasitoids. Some of the teeny tiny ones, they will actually lay their eggs inside of things like caterpillars, but also aphids, for example, and then they will, the larvae will consume the host insect from the inside out. So um, 
Wasps also feed with the tongue like bees, which is unsurprising because they're the, the ancestors of bees. So don't discount wasps, y'all. And finally, I like to say the catch-all, the four bees and more. Beetles, bugs, bats, and hummingbirds. <laughs> so all of these are pollinators when they feed on nectar or pollen on a flower and there, thereby transfer the pollen to the female part of the flower. So that's the what of wild seed. So let's talk for a minute about why. We're going to transition to that and have a conversation about why we need wildscapes. And I'm going to focus, because this is my area of interest, I'm going to focus on insects and other arthropods, which provide us a ton of eco services. So let's take a look at that. So we're going from pollinators only to insects in general, more than just the subset of pollinating insects. So there was a study done uh, about 15 years ago now, uh, which it was really interesting. It wanted to figure out the value, approximate value, of the eco services that native insects, not honeybees, for example, native insects gave to our economy in a year here in the United States. And they concluded it was a, around $60 billion a year in eco services which they admitted was low, <laughs> but this was their low estimate. So let's break that down a little bit. So of course, that group of insects that are pollinators, we need them to pollinate our food crops, right? So that we humans can have food. So that translates to about two thirds of our crops or about a third of the food that's on our plate every day. And this is billions of dollars in eco services a year, but it's more than just pollination of our crops. It's pollination of flowering plants. And depending on which study you, um, you read, they ballpark it at around 75 to 95% of the flowering plants on earth need some kind of animal, whether it's an insect or otherwise to pollinate it, or it won't propagate future generations. So that's a large number, right? Even if it's only 75%, it's probably higher. So why do we need this? Well, future generators, generations of pollinators, and insects that eat leaves of plants need those plants to continue through the years. And so if those flowering plants to produce those um, future plants with flowers and leaves and berries and nuts and all that stuff, if they need insect or other pollinators, then we need those pollinators. Likewise, um, a lot of different animals eat the different fruits and berries of these plants that need pollination to produce fruits and berries. And so we need pollinators to ensure that food source for um, humans and other animals continues. Um, additionally, uh, well, plants also provide a lot of services for us. So they help prevent erosion, they help prevent flood control. Uh, the deeper the root of the plant, the more water it can sequester in a just sort of regular rainstorm. Likewise, the deeper the root, the more carbon it can sequester. So these are important and for our survival as a species and for the survival of the planet we need them. And then insects are just good eating y'all. <laughs> There's a lot of things that eat insects and insects are particularly good, Dr. Tallamy explains in his books, I'll show you those later, at converting the energy that's stored in plants into things like protein and fat and other nutrients for animals. Um, so uh, they directly feed things like um, uh, reptiles and amphibians and birds, and we'll talk about birds more in a second. They also indirectly are responsible for pollinating those plants that need it to produce berries and fruits and nuts. And so that's what the squirrel is there to represent. He's eating a berry. And so um, they, for those plants that need animal pollination, help with that. So let's talk for a minute about how important, by looking at the example of birds, how important these insects are when they are directly eaten in the food chain. Okay, so Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, he and some others over the years have decided to study like how many insects it takes to feed birds. And here's the fact that I wasn't aware of until I read his books and read the studies um, that were produced afterwards, that about 96% of our terrestrial bird species, their chicks can eat only insects and other arthropods. The chicks cannot digest the grains, berries, nuts, and seeds that their parents can. So for 96% of the terrestrial bird species, 
the babies are dependent on insects and other arthropods as a food source. So Dr. Ptolemy and others, and you see them cited at the bottom of the slide, wanted to figure out how many insects and arthropods are needed on average. And so they studied Carolina chickadees. And they looked at the number of insects that a single mama chickadee needed for a single clutch of her babies in a single year. It was either they or a study they reported. And the results were nothing short of astonishing. It's not dozens, it's not hundreds, it's thousands, thousands of insects and other arthropods to feed a single clutch of Carolina chickadees. Multiply that by all the Carolina chickadees and then just guess how many are needed to support the chicks of all terrestrial birds in that 96%. So if we don't have insects in our urban areas, baby birds can't survive. Either the parents just don't produce them or the babies starve. So insects are hugely important in the food chain. Food chain. Insects also provide decomposition services. Um, so they recycle dung, they recycle carrion, they recycle dead plant matter. Um, they also help develop soil composition and uh, structure. So when insects die and they degrade, they can release nutrients like nitrogen into the soil. So they have a really big part to play in decomposition. And finally, they provide about four and a half billion dollars a year in pest control, either because they're predators that eat other insects or because they're parasitoids, which means they lay their eggs in other insects and their larvae consume the host insect from the inside out. That's a huge number. As Dr. Talamy says, to paraphrase him, insects kind of take care of their own. And if you're having an issue, in your garden with pest insects, you probably need more insects to help take care of them, in addition to the reptiles, amphibians, birds, and so forth that will eat some of those insects. The problem is that insects are in a world of hurt right now. The drivers of insect decline are numerous, they're complex, and scientists, I'm gonna be honest with you, are not 100% sure how they interact. But they are seeing signs of insect decline in pockets based on different studies in different areas around the world. And these are the things that appear to be affecting it, again, although they're not entirely sure how these interrelate. Um, some of the chief ones among them are habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. So where we live now used to be a coastal prairie, and it was one continuous piece of prairie. Now it's broken apart, so it's fragmented, and that makes it hard on a systemic level for wildlife. It's also degraded, so as we use soil over and over, we might be compacting it, we might be changing its composition, and habitat loss has been taken up by cement, houses, you know, parks that we have planned in certain ways, not necessarily as wildlife supported parks. So so these are huge problems. In addition to pesticides and herbicides, climate change and climate disruption are problematic too. Um, and then competition by non-native insects and plants. And we'll talk a little bit about non-native plants that might be invasive. So it's not that all non-native plants are problematic. It's just that those that are aggressive and that nothing here has evolved to eat can be, and they can push out or smother out some of our native plants. And we'll learn why that's a, a problem later. So there are many different drivers of insect decline. In fact, it's been described this year in a paper that came out of a, um, a symposium at the end of last year, I think, or the beginning of this year, as death by a thousand cuts. What the scientists seem to agree on is that there are serious declines in insect abundance, diversity, and biomass worldwide, even though they're just at the beginning of recording this you know, for the last few decades. They're also calling on governments and individuals to act now while they are still researching. Now think about this. For scientists to take off their white coats, come out of the lab, 
and say, we don't have all the answers yet, but we see the writing on the wall and it's bad. So you need to act. So that's the thing we need to listen to. These are entomologists telling us this. And they're calling for action at all levels, international, national, state, county, city, and individual. And I'm not gonna cite a bunch of different studies to you, but I'm gonna talk about one that um, made its way, it was a survey that made its way in June of 2019 into a four-part series in Manga Bay News, which often reports on the tropics. It was called The Great Insect Dying, Trouble, uh, The Tropics in Trouble and Some Hope. And so what they did was they surveyed 24 entomologists from six different uh, continents representing 12 countries. And they asked them a single question on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being not a, not a problem, to 10 being the most dire, how would these 24 entomologists rate the insect abundance crisis? Nobody rated it below an eight, and some rated it a 10, and that was in June of 2019. So it's not good, and I can't sugarcoat it. So <laughs> what do we do? How do we go about helping pollinators and other insects? So are you ready for the rejoice and be glad moment? Right here, right now, right in our own gardens. We form a critical link in the chain that will save insects and thus the ecosystem. Right here, right now, right at home. And you know, a chain is only as strong as all of its links individually are. And so I'm not gonna lie and say, that all we have to do is focus on our individual gardens. We still have to, in the way that we feel is best and vive la différence, in the way that we feel is best, it is still our civic duty on these other levels, international, national, state, and city and county, to try and make those changes that will help conserve insects and help support them in addition to making these changes at home, right? It's just that for many of those things, especially as you get higher up in that hierarchy, our influence is more indirect. But let's flip that coin, y'all. The flip side of that is what we do at home matters. It is an absolutely essential link in that chain. The chain fails without us at home. And in my home gardens, now there, I have power. That is a message of empowerment and hope, y'all. And I don't know about you, but that and a cup of coffee gets me going in the mornings. That's pretty awesome. So I want to um, explain why making these changes in our home garden matters. Because when we do it, in the words of some researchers, we create what are called stepping stones. In other words, that teeny little bee that was on that Texas frog fruit flower head cannot get from my house in Northwest Houston all the way down to Memorial Park. But by gum, it can get next door to the blanket flower that um, my neighbor let me <laughs> put in their garden, right? And it can get two houses down to the neighbor who has a uh, scarlet sage, salvia coccinea, and maybe Texas frog food, and maybe basket flower. And it can move three houses down from there. Are you with me? So we are inserting what some scientists call bio corridors or other stepping stones and reintroducing this into our urban settings. Remember we talked about how habitat fragmentation was a big problem? This connects. It connects those dots for the critters so that they can move around and get what they need. Dr. Talamy's new uh, book, um, Nature's Best Hope, he calls it Homegrown National Park. Isn't that cool? Right? If we take the acreage that we have in our little home gardens and we convert even part of it to wildlife supportive gardens, then we are helping reintroduce what we humans took away. So I want to read something from uh, uh, 
bringing nature home. This is what he said. I think it's just a great little quotation. Now for the first time in history, gardening has taken on a role that transcends the needs of the gardener. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing, to make a difference. Y'all, this is like voting. This is like caring for um, others in need. This is our civic duty. And it's gardening. Now, isn't that fun? Okay, before we get into the how, y'all, I wanted to show you a couple of books. If I could recommend only two books on the why of gardening for wildlife, I would recommend Dr. Doug Callamy's books here. Bringing Nature Home is over 10 years old and Nature's Best Hope is the sequel to that. It came out in February of, I think, 2020. If you had to pick just one, I would pick Nature's Best Hope simply because it's more recent. They're fantastic. They don't read like an entomologist wrote them. <laughs> they read very naturally, easy to digest, easy to read. Okay, y'all ready for tips on how to do this at home? Okay, so we're going to spend the last 20 minutes or so talking about how we create beautiful and effective home wildscapes. Again, all about critters, but also all about community. Uh, before we begin, I want to recommend three books. So um, The Living Landscape, which you see on the left here, is by Dr. Doug Tallamy, whom I mentioned before, and Rick Dark, who's a landscape um, architect or a landscaper who specializes in native plants. And they wrote this together. And this takes the why that Dr. Tallamy gave in those other books and shows you how to do it. I would say that if your um, level of gardening is more beginner, this is a great book to start with. This really helped me early on. Planting in a Post Wild World is by Rainier and West. I quoted them earlier in the presentation. So this is a great book. I'd say this is sort of middle level. So I will be honest with you, this one does not um, advocate strictly for the use of plants native to the ecoregion. It talks about using plants that, that grow well in a region, but they totally recognize these authors do that you can do everything that they say for design with native plants. So everything that they say in design, totally doable. Again, that's about mid-level. And this is the highest level. It's above my pay grade, y'all. <laughs> I use it as a reference book. Um, I'm still reading through it after several months. I put it down and pick it up, but oh, it has taught me some invaluable stuff. So this is called Garden Revolution by Larry Weiner and, and Thomas Christopher. It is outstanding. But again, probably if you're at a more advanced level. Okay, five tips. So if I could give you one tip today and no others, it would be this tip, support the home team. And by support the home team, what I mean is to plant plants that are native to our ecoregion. In other words, those that, that have evolved closest to home. So what is a native plant? When I began this journey in 2015 or so, I had no idea that there is actually a discussion that's ongoing about what a native plant is. So um, there are different ways that different people define it, depending on time, depending on various other things, distance. But I like Dr. Ptolemy's way of understanding it. He talks about um, a native plant being a plant having historical evolutionary relationships with a particular wildlife community. So he kind of breaks that down into three parts. There's the concept of time, place, and community. Time. So the plant has been there for millennia. Okay, not just a few hundred years, but thousands of years. That's important because as it evolves, things evolve with it. Place, it's been there for millennia. It has evolved in an area with similar um, light, soil, water, wind, other conditions, right? So in a part of uh, the world that shares some similarities of, um, uh, I can't think of the word for it, but sun, water, soil, and so on. And finally, community. To my mind, there is no such thing as a native plant in the abstract. A plant is native only when you think about how it has co-evolved with other plants and animals in that place for millennia. 
Okay, so that's the kind of understanding that I have for native plant in this Dr. Talmans. This is a good map from um, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Uh, Department, You can see the URL at the bottom on the eco regions of Texas. You can see that sort of dark gray blue on uh, the coast there. This is the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes eco region. And in particular, we're in the Northern humid Gulf coastal prairies ecosystem. So as much as possible, we wanna choose plants that have evolved in this area and the closer we are to our own home that they've evolved the better i will say that the conditions out here or up here or even up here in texas are very different from those in brownsville or the hill country or here in our coastal marsh prairies or our coastal prairies and that's why when we go into a local nursery even one that sells native plants we should be very careful about those plants that we pick. And so I never go shopping without my little pocket computer. And what I will do is, even in displays that say Texas native, you know, Texas has a lot of eco regions and it's big. What I do is this, I get the Latin name of the plant. I use Uncle Google <laughs> or some search engine I type in the Latin name and then I type in either USDA or you can type in BONAP, B-O-N-A-P, Biota of North American Plants. I'm saying that wrong. I forget what the acronym stands for. Either USDA or B-O-N-A-P. And either of those will take you to a site where there's a map that breaks down native status by county, okay? On the USDA side, you actually have to zoom in. It's an interactive map to see where in Texas it's native. Now, counties are not the same as ecoregions, but I do find it helpful. And my rule of thumb is whenever I replace a plant or put in new plants, I choose only those that are native to my county or perhaps the county that USDA or BONAP says is right around. It. You with me? Okay, so. The question becomes, why are native plants superior and why am I focusing on that? Well, the bottom line is they tend to feed more critters. So unsurprisingly, when an animal, especially an insect, has evolved with a plant in that particular place over millennia, at least some of those animals have probably evolved to be able to benefit from that plant in some way, either by eating the pollen or the nectar or the leaf or more than one of those things. Because plants, actually their leaves especially contain chemicals in them that can be toxic or off-putting to some insects and some animals, but others that have evolved may have evolved mechanisms to be able to digest them. Um, so we call this, uh, so that's what I'll say on that. Um, hmm. Okay, well, I'm missing my notes, but that's okay. So uh, some of the studies that you see at the bottom cite an earlier study that indicates that about 90% of insects at some point in their life, in their development, are specialists. So what is a specialist? So a specialist is an insect or animal that can eat only those plants in a specific family, genus, or species. That's all it's evolved to eat, even species. You see this particularly with moth and butterfly caterpillars, although not all of them are specialists. So a good example that everyone's familiar with is the monarch butterfly. It can feed pretty much only on milkweed or some close vines. So the genus Asclepius. So they are specialists on milkweed and milkweed is toxic to a lot of other insects, but there's a whole group of them that have evolved to be specialists on that. So one of the reasons that we want to have native plants in our gardens is because more insects will be able to eat the leaf, the nectar, or the pollen. And likewise, some bees, their larvae are specialists on the pollen of only certain plants in a particular family, genus, or species. Not all, and not the majority, but some. So that's the first thing. Um, the study that you see at the bottom in 2018 was studying how non-native plants in landscapes in a particular part of the country might affect the insect population and thus the bird population 
And what they concluded was that ecosystems dominated, and this is a quotation, by non-native plants are characterized by reduced insect diversity, abundance, and biomass. And remember, we talked about all those ecoservices that insects bring us, right? Not the least of which is that baby birds and other animals need to eat insects and other arthropods, at least some species do. And so our plants should be feeding insects and other creatures. And so we want native plants that can do this, especially for those specialist insects. Native plants are also hardier in our climate. Um, if something has evolved to be nuked in the summer and drowned in the spring, <laughs> which is what we have in Galveston and Houston and all points in between, probably it's gonna do better and not rot in the spring or shrivel up and die in the fall or in the summer. And I will say that not every native plant is drought tolerant. Many are because they're prairie plants and prairies would go for long periods without rain. And so they've evolved to be able to deal with it. But we have some water loving native plants as well. For example, buttonbush and some others. In our gardens, we choose drought tolerant native plants. And I do that because I almost, I really don't have to water them much. And that saves me money and it saves me time. And it also saves me the cost of replacing plants that die. They can also save and purify water and prevent erosion. So what you see here is a cross section of a prairie. Now, this is not necessarily our coastal prairie. I don't think it is. This is the top of the land right here. This is prairie um, grasses and forbs above and below it are roots. You see how thick some of those roots are. Some of our prairie plants, their roots can be as deep as a human adult is tall. So sometimes 14 feet deep. Not all of them, but some of them. And remember what I said earlier, the deeper the root, the more water and the more carbon that prairie plant can sequester. So with all the water and all the flooding we get in Galveston and Houston, this is what I want in my garden. And the Katy Prairie Conservancy a few years back gave me some statistics um, in an average rainstorm, not a flood. St. Augustine lawn can sequester maybe half an inch of water per hour. But a full on prairie, not our gardens, but a full on prairie can sequester inches. So the more plants I have that are native to our prairie, the better it's probably going to be at absorbing a regular amount of rainwater. It's also okay if these native plants in my garden get out, even if they're aggressive. It doesn't matter because they were always here. And so checks and balances have evolved to keep them from overtaking the world. The problem is when we have a non-native plant that is aggressive and that nothing here has evolved to eat, that's the problem. And that's what we mean by invasive. I'm not a hater of non-native plants. I'm about 10% non-native, but I don't have anything in my garden that's invasive. In other words, aggressive, that nothing can eat, so that if it gets out, it can crowd out our native plants. You know, if, if there's, I'm not trying to say that our insects and other fauna here have not evolved to eat non-native plants. Sometimes they can. Think of the black swallowtail butterfly. It can eat things like parsley, rue, fennel, and dill. Those are not native to North America. So I'm not worried about those plants as much, right? It's just that not every insect here can do that. And so this is an example of a plant that is an invasive. This is Chinese tallow. These trees were brought in for various reasons, including landscaping. They are considered invasive. We call them popcorn trees here in the South, and they're just absolutely dreadful. Birds will eat the berries and disperse the seeds all over. We get them in our yard all the time. There is no tree next to us, um, and we get them in our yard. They grow fast. They're allelopathic in their leaf, meaning their leaves have a chemical that suppresses the growth of other plants and they shade out prairie remnants. I mean, they're awful. So I'm gonna give you a, a list of plants that may be in our gardens um, that have been uh, uh, listed as invasive by at least some organization locally, including some on the Houston Audubon Society's list. Chinese tallow, Bradford pear, 
Mandina or heavenly bamboo. Mandina with those pretty orange berries, which are cyanide based and kill birds. Ligustrum, elephant ear, pampas grass, Chinese privet, and Japanese honeysuckle. We have native equivalents, aggressive or not, if they get out, it's not an issue. So if you have non-natives in your garden, make sure they are not considered invasive. So that's tip number one, and that is the main one. Okay, tip number two, avoid pesticides. So I love this book. It's by Jessica Walliser. It's called Attracting Beneficial Bugs. It's easy to read. She not only introduces you to insect predators and parasitoids, but um, she explains what plants, nectar and pollen, the adults like to eat so that you can plant those to attract them, to take care of your insect issues in your gardens. And then she has garden designs, both for, I, I think primarily for vegetable and fruit gardens, but even so how to pair them with some uh, flowering plants to bring in those predators that you need. Great book. So um, instead of using pesticides, which are kind of equal opportunity killers on all of our insects, welcome in predators and parasitoids and let them do the job for you, right? And I'm gonna give you a quick example. So how many of us have milkweed or other plants that get aphids? So the milkweeds get these yellow oleander aphids, but others may get, you know, like my gara, my dill, my fennel, all of that. They have tons of aphids on them. So um, what you see here, top left and top right, these are the larvae of some of those hoverflies I was telling you about. The adults are pollinators, but the larvae are the ones that can consume between two and 400 aphids before they pupate. And here's the pupal phase of one of those species. And they'll just suck those aphids down. And so the mama is attracted by the um, sticky honeydew that the aphid puts out. She'll lay her eggs and her babies will hatch and eat all of those aphids. This is a horrible picture, but that is one of those little um, uh, parasitoid wasps that mama is laying her egg right in that um, bee balm aphid right there, that little pink one. And this is a lady beetle larva eating an oleander aphid on milkweed. So it goes in cycles, y'all, it takes patience. Couple of weeks, you have an infestation of a lot of aphids. The predators come in, they lay their eggs. Within a couple of weeks, all the aphids are gone. So patience is the primary thing. Third, mix it up. So remember before I told you there was a method to my madness. Think about those different mouth parts that those insects have, right? That are pollinators. Think about their different sizes, right? Body sizes are larger or smaller. They feed differently. So variety is the spice of life, y'all, including with insects and pollinators. So we want to have variety in our garden. So what does this mean? It translates into multiple things. First, we want to choose flowers of different sizes and colors. So different sizes because some of the larger ones might be an easier landing platform for larger insects like the bigger butterflies, for example, and smaller ones may be better suited to our tiny pollinators. Colors is what I did not realize. So insects see colors differently from each other. Um, as an example, bees are particularly good at seeing yellow, white, and purple. Um, but they're not as good at distinguishing red from green, although they'll feed on red flowers. Butterflies and hummingbirds, in contrast, are really good at seeing reds. And so you don't have to memorize what colors the different insect pollinators in your gardens can see best. Just have a bunch of different colors. You're going to tick someone's box. And plus, it's super duper pretty. You also, uh, variety is the spice of life when it comes to the structure of flowers. So again, different mouth parts, different sizes, different body shapes. You want tubular, composite, umbelliform, like dill, fennel, milkweed, and mellow flowers. Composite flowers in the middle are particularly good bang for the buck for almost any insect, and here's why. The outside are what we call ray petals. This middle part is actually a whole bunch of teeny tiny nectar and pollen rewards. So it's kind of like a bunch of flowers mashed together in the middle, okay, without with only the one set of big petals on the outside. This means that large and small insects can feed on here. It's kind of like going to the shopping mall and getting all your shopping done in one place rather than driving around to a bunch of independent stores. So I always uh, weigh heavily on the composite flowers in my garden. 
I also want to choose plants that bloom in different seasons. So we want to have the buffet open, not just in spring and summer, but also in fall through the very late fall. So all I do when I select plants is I intentionally choose those, some of those that are gonna bloom later and some that bloom very, very early in the spring. Tip four, pile it up. By this, I mean to plant in clusters by species, okay? Plant in clusters by species. So Flo Hanna, whom I never had the pleasure of meeting when she was uh, alive, unfortunately, she did so much amazing work at the Katy Prairie Conservancy. But one of the things she used to say is that the human eye likes to see things clustered in odd numbers, threes, fives, sevens, right? And she's absolutely right. So aesthetically speaking, when we cluster our Indian blanket, you know, our Texas coneflower, our American germander, whatever, as you see here, when we cluster them in those odd numbered groups and make a big um, a, a grouping of them, we um, aesthetically, we're giving the eye a place to rest. And the more that you cluster in a garden bed, the more intentional and the more traditional the garden looks, okay? It's not that you can't have things sprinkled all around, it just looks less traditional, that's all. So if you want it to look more traditional, then cluster. There's also a biological reason, and that is that certain insects, in particular bees, um, just some species, but they will practice what's called flower constancy, where they want to feed from the pollen or nectar of a particular species of flower before moving to another. Uh, honeybees are an example of, of those practicing flower constancy, which also makes them really good crop pollinators. So having them clustered together actually makes it easier for them to expend less energy while getting the pollen and nectar that they wish. Um, and finally, those large patches of color might be more visible to butterflies flying overhead. So there's a biological and an aesthetic reason. You can also include combination patches. So in the Native Plant Society of Texas Native Landscape Certification Program, I think it's level two, they talk about garden design. And one of the things they talk about is pairing together complementary colors to give more energy. So things that are opposite on the color wheel, like Monarda fistulosa here, the purple, and um, Rebecca texana, Texas coneflower. Those are pretty much opposite on the color wheel, just like this hill country native aromatic aster and our seaside goldenrod here. So you can do combination patches. If you plant um, plants with color, flower colors that are close on the color wheel, things like blue and green, purple and, and, um, and uh, blue, that gives a soothing effect. So I credit NUPSOT Native Landscape Certification Program with that. And finally, we'll end with embracing imperfection and talk about what that means. So sometimes doing less in our wildlife habitat garden is actually better for wildlife. So in our gardens, we leave pithy and hollow stems intact even after a freeze and we leave some seed heads up as well. So the first thing that I wanna do after a freeze is I wanna cut back all those unsightly brown stems, right? But I cordially invite you not to, and here's why. About 30% of our native bee species will nest above ground. And those that nest above ground might nest in wood like carpenter bees or in little crevices. But some of the teeny ones will actually nest in pithy and hollow stems. They'll bite into the side or come down through the top and kick out all the pith and they'll lay their eggs there. And so if I were to cut back and compost all of those stems, I might be composting baby bees. And the same with some of our teeny tiny native wasps to my understanding. And so I want those wasps in my garden to take care of my insect pests. I also leave some seed heads like you see on the right here. These are Texas cone flower and I think some rough cone flower because over the winter, some birds and other critters will want to eat them. And if I cut them off, I might drop them right at the base of the plant so that they're there and available for wildlife. I also, instead of mulch in my gardens, um, and reasonable minds can disagree on this, but instead of mulch, I use leaves. And here's why I do that. About 70% of our native bee species and a very good number of our native wasp species actually nest underground. 
these are, are most of our uh, native bee species and wasp species and bees for sure are what we call solitary nesters, whether they're above or below ground, meaning they don't nest in a collective hive, okay? And about 70% of those dig tunnels in the ground and they nest in the ground, okay? So if I put in heavy mulch, I would might possibly be preventing the females from getting to the ground to make their nest, or depending on what time of year I put it down, I might prevent the babies that are hatching from coming up. So I want to, to put in something that's looser and leaf litter is a really good way to do that. It's also a good way to take leaves from getting, you know, being composted or thrown out. Um, so I use them in my garden. If you do use them in your garden bed, three cautions first. I would not shred them unless your uh, homeowners association requires it. The reason for this is that some moth and even butterfly caterpillars will pupate on leaves. And when the leaves drop, the pupa are still there. And so if I shred them, I might be shredding those. Second, um, I, the other thing is I want to make sure that I get the leaves from a yard that doesn't use herbicides or pesticides. If I get some from my neighbor, if they use herbicides and pesticides, I might be putting that in my garden bed. And finally, I want to make sure that I don't take the leaves from plant species that have those allelopathic chemicals in them that suppress the growth of other plants. Primarily here in Houston, that would be a magnolia. I'm not sure about pecan, but for sure magnolia are allelopathic in the leaf. In other areas, it might be eucalyptus or black walnut, for example. So those are my three thoughts on that. And when those little spring wildflowers pop up, either in my garden bed or in the lawn, I let them go. So in my car, in my yard, we, I have a little push mower and I mow around patches of wildflowers. And it's just a conversation over a cup of coffee with my neighbors so they don't think I'm crazy, so they know why I'm doing it. But you know, in, in early February there, as these insects come out of diapause, which is their equivalent of hibernation, there might be nothing else blooming. And so, you know, they need crow poison and chickweed and oxalis and other things to, to feed on. They may have nothing else. And that, my friends, is that. I went a couple of minutes over, but I thank you for your patience. Well, Lauren, we thank you. This was a wonderful talk. I mean, it was just like I was listening to Doug Tallamy in my mind. This is Patty. So great. We have a few questions. And so Robin, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation and for your message and your heart for wildlife. Thank you. I love your concept of frog fruit and I'm doing it in my yard and I want to ask number one, why is it your favorite? And then number two, how you keep it from overpowering your blue bonnets and other wildflowers, okay? <laughs> Thank you. I, I am with you. And your name again? Robin. Robin. Oh, it's right there on the screen. I knew that. No Hi, worries. Robin. <laughs> Robin, thank you for that question. Anytime I can talk about Texas frog fruit, I'm a happy camper. So why it's my favorite. So the thing I love about it is that it's green all year round. So it works in a lawn and I also use it as green mulch in the words of some other uh, writers in my garden beds. Uh, so it's green year round. About half the year it has these teeny cute little flowers and I stop documenting at 30 species of insect feeding on them. Yeah. It is also um, the host plant for the caterpillars of three butterfly species, species, including two that are local. You can drown it and not kill it. It doesn't want to be in standing water for an extended time, but it can have wet feet and it can be bone dry. I never water mine. I never cover it in a freeze. I don't have to. Okay. In the lawn, you can walk on it. You can mow it. Doesn't kill it. Okay. So that's why it's my favorite. <laughs> um, it's ubiquitous too. <laughs> Once you have it, you always have it. Okay. You can, it can go full sun down to part shade, but I see a comment about horse herb works better in shade. Yeah. Frog fruit does not want full shade. So something like horse herb, which is actually not native to our area. It's actually native to the very Southern tip of Texas, the best I can figure, but it's ubiquitous here. Um, horse herb can be in full sun or in full on shade and you can mow it and walk on it too. So a lawn with those mixed together is really nice. It's easy underfoot. So the thing about it, Robin, is it is aggressive. It is a native. It was always here, but it's aggressive. 
So when I use it as green mulch in my garden beds, I pair it only with those plants that are also really strong perennials. Um, I don't put it in beds with things that are like uh, annuals, like uh, bitter sneeze weed or blue bonnets or some like that. It's only in those beds with other ground covers or medium or tall plants that can fight their way out of it. Does that make sense? So um, I have a volunteer hybrid gara that nothing can suppress. Right. Um, I've got a butterfly gara that nothing can suppress. I've got Texas coneflower. I even have tall goldenrod, which volunteered, which now I wish I had in a different bed, but these are all things, you know, different coneflowers. They do uh, blue mist flower. They'll come up despite the frog fruit. But I would not put it in a bed with blue bonnets. Does that make sense? Exactly. And not yeah. This is my first year with it, and it it overpowered them. So that's yeah. yeah that's exactly what I learned. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that question. Okay. Next up, we have Gene. Gene, would you unmute and ask your question? Yes, ma'am. So early on, when you started showing pictures of bees and talked about all the different types of bees. Uh, it reminded me of the stories I see on the news routinely about this big bee die off and end up talking to beekeepers and they talk about how we're all going to die if they die. It occurs to me that most of those stories are about honeybee, or at least I've always taken them to be about honeybees. Is that the case? And is it occurring across all species? So that's a great question, Jean. Thank you. Um, so let me just say right off that I'm, I'm, not 100% sure about all the data for native bees. And I think part of that is that there's not as much data on native bees, okay? Yeah, most news stories go to honeybees because that's right. all that most people think of. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those things are problems that for sure are affecting what we call um, the opposite of solitary is not communal, uh, social. So social nesters like bumblebees, which are native, can be native here. We have, you know, native species, maybe the odd non-native, and then honeybees. Um, we do have some social native bees, but they're mainly solitary. And so I think it's the category of solitary native bees that don't have as much data collected. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I would say that as a general proposition, it looks like I think of all things, probably bees and butterflies and moths are studied more than others. That's just sort of my sense of it. And we're seeing declines kind of you know, across different orders of insects, though not with every single species. My guess is that native bees uh, numbers are going down as well, but I, I don't know that I have the data to say that. Um, but I, why would they not? Right, <laughs> Their right. habitat being destroyed, their food right. sources are being destroyed. They're being uh, replaced with non-native plants. If they happen to be a species that is co-evolved um, so that its larvae can feed only on a particular family genus or species of plant with pollen, you know, I, how could they not be affected? <laughs> okay. um, but I, you know what I'm saying? I don't have the data to parse that sure. out. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Our next question is from Ron Williams. My question has to do with uh, raising honeybees in an urban area. In a previous previous city, in a previous state, uh, we had honeybees in our backyard, which was completely okay with everybody, as long as we went to the county and registered them. Uh, and what the results of registering them is that the city was not allowed to spray for mosquitoes within X amount of feet uh, from our house. Our neighbors didn't like that, but it saved our bees. In here in Texas, and in especially where we live now, there doesn't seem to be that kind of leniency. So how up where you live, where you're attracting all of these pollinators and the larvae and stuff, how do you deal with the city and county so that the mosquito sprayers don't wipe you out? So that's a really good question, Ron. Um, so, in Har it, it, it's county by county. In Harris County, you can ask, you can register with the county and ask that the spray trucks not spray from the street in front of your house. It's house by house. To my mind, 
you know, and, and they tend not to spray unless there's been like a West Nile virus, you know, picked up, right? Mm -hmm. So we haven't had any spraying so far that I can tell. And it's not all the time. Um, to my mind, if they can spray at the neighbor on either side of me, then does it really matter if they turn it off right in front of my house? I guess it doesn't get on my plantings in the front yard. Um, you can also sign up. So that, that's a problem. And I don't think there's any, like, because I have my gardens, that no one on the street, there can't be any spraying. I don't think that's how it works in Harris County. In fact, to the contrary, you have to opt out of it. Um, the other thing is that you can ask them to advise you to send you an auto call to tell you when they're gonna do it so that I assume you could go out and just cover your plants. Um, in our neighborhood, I, I haven't gotten organized enough to do that, but I do have a neighbor in my subdivision who has done it. And she says, sometimes she gets the call and sometimes she doesn't. <laughs> And sometimes they don't spray in front of her house and sometimes they just forget to turn off the sprayer for one house, you know? So uh, I don't think, I think it's county by county and I think it depends. I don't know of any studies that talk about the adverse effect of the mosquito spraying on other pollinators. They do tend to spray at night, but again, it doesn't mean that there are pollinators out because there are nocturnal pollinators and the diurnal pollinators, many of them nest outside, they roost. So male bees pretty much roost outside and even some females when they're not nesting. So, you know, and what if the spray gets on? I don't know how long it stays on the surface, right? So I don't know what the answers are, but um, I haven't found data yet that explains what the adverse, like precisely what, if any adverse effects there are on other insects. Does that make sense besides the target oh, yeah. mosquitoes? Uh, yes. There may be data. I just haven't found, I haven't seen it yet. That doesn't mean there isn't any. Okay, well, thank you. That's Ron, the only fact that's keeping us from having hives here is mosquito well, sprayers. Yeah, and um, the other thing I would suggest is that the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, X-E-R-C-E-S, is a fantastic organization. It focuses um, on all invertebrates, but primarily insects and arthropods. And it does have, um, it has a lot of educational materials and information sheets. And I believe it has a whole packet on, um, uh, on um, mosquito spraying as well. We have something in the chat about in Galveston County, you have to write a letter yearly asking them not to spray and so on and so forth. Okay. So well, my guess is, I live in. Yeah. Well, thank, yep. thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next question is from Madeline. Uh, yes, is there any way to be sure that you're purchasing live native plants versus getting a modified or an hybrid version that doesn't have the same growth habit and it doesn't yeah. produce the food resources for wildlife the same. It may look similar, but it may not produce berries or it may not yeah. produce nectar or whatever. It looks similar, but it's different. Right, that's a great question, Madeline. Um, yeah, the question I think if I'm understanding right is, how can you be assured that you're getting a straight species that's native as opposed to one that's hybridized like a cultivar, a native or whatever? Right. So it really depends on the source that you go to, right? Um, so one good rule of thumb is anything that talks about like double bloom, right? Um, probably is a hybrid because they've been hybridized in order to come up with a bigger inflorescence for aesthetic purposes. Also, anything, not always, but most of the time, I find that when there's a fancy name added, so like, um, you know, blanket flower, you know, crimson dawn, right? Or crimson whatever, right? You know, like a special name, right? On the end, yeah. that probably those are hybrids or cultivars of some kind. Probably so. And probably not the straight species. Although that's not always true, but very often it is. 
I would say that the source really, really matters. And in fact, if you're ever in doubt, um, I would ask uh, some of the folks who work there. So big box stores, you're gonna be, have less luck. But in Houston, we have like Buchanan's native plants, Joshua's native plants, and they sell a lot of things that are not native and they do sell hybrids and cultivars. But if you tell them that you're in there and you want the straight species and ask to speak to someone who's knowledgeable, they'll help you with that, okay? Um, there are some places that sell only plants that are native to the ecoregion that are straight species. So let me give a plug for the Native Plant Society of Texas chapters that are local. You have one in Clear Lake. And I just became a member of that when I renewed my NUPSOT registration. So Houston and Clear Lake, because they're awesome. And then NUPSOT Houston. NUPSOT Clear Lake has a sale in the, the spring and the fall. It's a big fundraiser for them. But all of their members who work the sale, they're so knowledgeable. And everything you get is going to be the straight native species, very often with seed harvested locally. The same is true for Nupsot Houston. It has a fall sale called uh, where it, it does a, a workshop called Wildscapes Workshop. It's in the fall, September, sometimes October. And there you it's like a half-day program with lunch. And then they have a plant sale, which is amazing. You don't have to be a NUPSOT member, but you do have to register for that. The Houston Arboretum and Nature Center also has a spring and a fall uh, native plant sale, 100% native to the eco region, very knowledgeable folks. And my favorite that's open all the, every Friday during the year, except maybe holidays, is the Houston Audubon Society Natives Nursery. It's at the Edith L. Moore Nature Sanctuary. It is open to the public only on Fridays. And now I think they're still doing the COVID protocols where you order online and then you pick up, you schedule a pickup to pick up curbside on a Friday morning. You don't always have, um, you don't always have uh, uh, every single plant at those native plant sales but you have a lot of the very uh, common ones and they're super, super helpful. So those are all great places locally where you don't even have to think about it. Just sort of set it and forget it. Walk in and you know they're gonna be native 100%. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is from Denise. If you'd unmute yourself and ask. Uh, hi, Lauren, great that you're here. Um, um, I have trouble transplanting frog freight. Um, it's just hit and miss. And I have a lot of it in my yard and some places uh, it, it really needs to be somewhere else. And I try to move it where I really would like it. And then it, it just dies and looks like nothing, dirt, <laughs> soil. I'm with you. So <laughs> I have a couple of tricks for you. Okay. And by the way, Doris Heard just put in the chat that the uh, Houston Garden Club at the bulb sale, I think it is, that's coming up, or bulb mart, they have a real deal native plant booth. Yeah, the October bulb and plant mart. So that's another place that you can get them. And if anyone else knows of any other native plant um, sales, either in your area or mine, please throw them in the chat. Um, so Denise, I'm so glad you're here today. Um, <laughs> so Denise. Texas frog fruit. So when I dig it up to transplant it, I have about a 50% survival rate when I transplant it. So for folks who don't know frog fruit, it does like mint sort of, you get stem, root, stem, root, stem, root, right? And it snakes out that way. And the roots are not very deep. I'd say, what would you say, Denise? About an inch, inch and a half, they're pretty yeah. shallow. So if you're gonna dig it up where the roots are a little bit traumatized, then wherever you put it next, I take a big old mound. Um, I take a big old mound of dirt and I just pile it right over that root nodule, okay? Even though it covers the green there. Mm -hmm. And then I do that the same for each of those root nodules so that like about a third of the plant is covered in dirt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's what I do. And then literally every day for two weeks minimum, water it. Uh. Okay. Um, you can also root frog fruit very easily. 
So I would cut the flowers off, root it for a couple of weeks in water if you need even that long, and then the roots aren't as traumatized, put it in the ground, and I had really good success rate with that. But again, water it religiously every day for two weeks. And right now it's so hot, I would tent it with like a little stool or something so that it doesn't burn up. Ah, thanks. When, when you plant it. Okay, that's it for the questions. Lauren, I wanna thank you so much for your tips on creating a wild sky at our homes that will support wildlife. I know our master gardeners and master naturalists really appreciate all the interesting information you shared with us today. So thank you, thank you.